Uh, Professor <coughs> Noam Chomsky <coughs> is listed in anybody's catalog as among the half dozen top heroes of the new left. The standing he achieved by adopting over the past two or three years a series of adamant positions projecting at least uh, American foreign policy at most America itself. Uh, his essays and speeches are collected in his new book, American Power and the New Mandarins. Uh, usually Mr. Chomsky writes non-political books, for instance, Syntactic Structures in 1957, a Cartesian Linguistics in 1966, and Topics in the Theory of Generative Grammar, 1965. He is a highly esteemed student of modern language and linguistics who teaches nowadays at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and has taught before at Berkeley, Columbia, uh, and other strife-torn universities. He is a member of many organizations and learned societies, including I'm sure he would want me to mention the Aristotelian Society of Great Britain. In one of his essays, Mr. Chomsky writes, quote, by accepting the presumption of legitimacy of debate on certain issues such as this one, one has already lost one's humanity. I should like to begin by asking him why under the circumstances, if by being here he stands to lose his humanity, he consented to appear in the first place. Because, uh, first of all, I, I didn't quite put it in those terms, I don't think. I think that by, yeah, but I think that there are, I said that there are certain issues, for example, Auschwitz, such that by consenting to discuss them, one degrades oneself and to some degree loses one's humanity, and I think that that's true. Nevertheless, I can easily imagine circumstances in which I would have been glad to debate Auschwitz, for example, if there were some chance that by debating Auschwitz it might have been possible to eliminate it or to at least mitigate the horror of what was going on. And I think I feel the same way about Vietnam. And I really think that there is no, fundamentally there is no argument anymore on, on an, at an intellectual level in my opinion. But I think it's very important to discuss it nevertheless. At what level uh, is there an argument? Well, there, uh, the, uh, there is a policy which I think is a destructive and devastating policy. It's continuing. And uh, the, policy, the continuation of the policy is, uh, to some extent, based on the fact of public apathy or public acceptance. Hence, there still is the necessity to convince people that, uh, that they should act strongly to put an end to this policy. At what point um, was there an intellectual argument? At which point yeah. did an intellectual argument in favor of our intervening in Vietnam cease to exist? Well, as I say there, I think that there may have been a time when there was something to debate. For example, I think that in the middle 50s, though I was opposed to the policy, and I think that it was right to be opposed to it, nevertheless, I think it was a debatable issue in a sense in which it is no, it is no longer a debatable issue. Why is that? Because at the moment, I think it's really an issue of the survival of the existence of Vietnam as a as an entity, as a social and cultural entity. I think that's what's at stake. But even that could be intellectually argued, couldn't it? Well, in the same sense in which Auschwitz could be intellectually no, argued. No, I mean in a different sense. No, I think in the same sense. In fact, no. don't forget there were people who, who argued in favor of Auschwitz and gave... No, no, I, I haven't gotten that at all. Um, uh, I haven't had any such on this program, nor do I intend to. But it seems to me that um, even if what you said were correct, mm. there could be a perfectly legitimate argument over, for instance, the continuation of the state of Anguilla or the continuation of the state of Biafra, or the con continuation of the state of Goa. I didn't, I didn't ma say, talk about the existence of the state, I talked about the existence of the society as a social and cultural entity. I yeah. think that's what's at stake. Oh, okay, well, what, if it's at stake, uh, uh, mightn't there be two points of view about uh, how to help it evolve into uh, its natural forms, right? Oh, there are many different points of view. I think there are very legitimate. Well, there, there, there are very legitimate. Ar see, there are very legitimate issues that can be argued as to how the United States ought to most efficaciously put an end to its destructive actions in Vietnam. There are many different alternatives that might be thought of. Yeah, but these one, yes, the one way, of course, to put an end to America's necessary intervention is to uh, conclude the war successfully. That's a way. Yeah, right? one possible way is by okay. destroying Vietnam, but you, but which I think is probably the most likely outcome. Yeah. Well, now, for instance, one way in which we put an end to the Nazi occupation of France is by destroying Nazi Germany, correct? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, this was a position, which is a tenable position, 
and mutatis mutandis is a temple position. No, it, because uh, mutatis mutandis changes everything. Because, everything in this case. Case. because, because in this case, case it, 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 as you know, it's not only I, yeah. but people with whom I disagree, like yes, Arthur right. Schlesinger, Jr., who refers to your theological certitudes yeah. and your liberal application of them to or every subject in which you touch. So the subject of your own intolerance of other people's point of view is, I think, itself linguistically interesting. Well, first of all, I don't accept that uh, criticism. You see, if, if you look at that quotation, you'll notice that I put it in there and recall the context. I said that when I argue the issue, I feel a tone of moral and emotional falseness, mm -hmm. which I want to explain, mm -hmm. but then I go ahead to argue the issue. So that's a side remark intended to explain my own feeling of emotional and moral falseness, which is real. I do feel it. But nevertheless, I then go ahead for 300 pages or so to discuss this and related sure. issues. Sure. Yeah, so I don't, I don't really yeah. believe that it's fair to say that I'm not uh, I'm willing to tolerate the position. You're totally, you don't end the book by saying, I'm kind of odd in, in feeling this. You say, Ev everybody is odd who doesn't agree with me, right? No, I don't think so. Do but I say this that? is certainly the burden of your book. Uh, um, I, I wasn't which, aware of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I've given you know, an argument. Well, maybe this is, right. maybe this is a, a universal difficulty you're having, not being aware of certain people's <laughs> reading of your position. Well, then let me say, I think there are, for example, I think I take a very qualified and temperate position on many, many issues in this book. For example, take the issue of uh, the, the background of the Second World War, which I spent a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. If you notice, I end up with a statement saying that I don't see any way to give a clear, sharp resolution, clear, sharp answer to the question what we should have done in such and such circumstances. I discussed someone who did take a very strong and I think very honorable position, namely A.J. Musty, mm -hmm. and I say that I wish I could come out, I wish I could answer the question for myself whether I feel that I would have taken or would have rejected that position, but I don't see any way to do it because the issue is mixed. There are many help. issues I, I feel that way. On the other hand, see, when the issue is the, uh, you know, when the issue is, let's say, three million tons of bombs dropped on Vietnam, I don't feel that way anymore. Nevertheless, I'm still perfectly willing to argue the issue. Yeah calmly, quietly, and, and as you would have saved the dropping of the bombs in Dresden. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or the atom bomb. Yeah. See, well, I would have been willing to argue the dropping of the atom bomb, though I do feel that it's a war crime. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that you put some people at a disadvantage by uh, your a priori assertion that any position that disagrees with your own is intellectually a barren. Well, I didn't mean that, really. Let me explain. Sure. Maybe it didn't come across, but what I, what I meant was something else. I wanted to honestly state uh, my own emotional and my own my own feeling about entering into a debate over this so issue. Portno, portnoy wise. No, I think that the point is that I think it's only fair to an audience of readers to say this is the way I approach the issue, and you read me on the basis of this understanding, the best I can give as to the way I'm approaching this issue. And it's perfectly true that when I do, if you notice, what I say is that increasingly over the years in discussing this issue, I felt this feeling of emotional and moral falseness. And I think it would only be honest to express it. Sure. Then to go ahead with the discussion. Oh, oh, quite so. Uh, but you, you also say that you hate yourself for not having come to that position uh, earlier. Yeah, I do. Uh, I think which, that was uh, a very great, great mistake. Well, I hope to give you a little solace. Uh. But uh, the, the, the reason I do raise this, and, and I, I rejoice in your disposition to argue the Vietnam question, especially when I recognize what an act of self-control this must uh, involve. It does. Sure. It really does. I mean, I think and that this is the kind of well. issue where well. you know, sometimes I lose my temper. Maybe not. No. Maybe not tonight. <laughs> uh, because uh, if you would, I'd smash him the goddamn table. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you say, you say, and you have reason for not losing temper. <laughs> you say the war is simply an obscenity, a depraved act by weak and miserable men. Including all of us. Including myself, well, including every, that's the next sentence, the same yeah. sentence. Sure, well, sure, 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 yeah. sure, because you count everybody in the company of the guilty. I think that's true in this uh, case. Yeah, but See, one of the points I was trying... This is a sense of theological observation, isn't it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Because as somebody points out, if everybody's guilty of everything, then nobody's guilty of anything. No, I don't, well, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't believe that. See, I think that, I think the point that I'm trying to make, and I think ought to be made, is that the real... Uh, at least to me, I say this elsewhere in the book, the, what seems to me uh, a very, in a sense, terrifying aspect of our society and other societies is the equanimity and the detachment with which sane, reasonable, sensible people mm -hmm. can observe such events. I think that's more terrifying than the occasional Hitler or LeMay or other that crops up. These people would not be able to operate were it not for the this apathy and equanimity. And therefore, I think that it's, in some sense, the sane and reasonable and tolerant people who should 
who, who share a, a very serious burden of guilt that they very easily throw on the shoulders of others who seem more extreme and more violent. No, I agree, but, uh, but surely the emotional temperature of, uh, of yourself or myself or, or, or of other people mm. is not in and of itself an index an automatic index to the righteous certainly not. emotions. Certainly not. Uh, as I wouldn't mean it to uh, People were uh, approximately equally wrought up in the late 30s of whether or not America should help the Western powers that defend themselves against the Axis powers. And I think it is incorrect to suppose that people of either side were necessarily uh, right simply because they were Axis Oh, powers. I'd agree with that totally. Yeah. There's no connection whatsoever between you know, yeah. degree of emotion and degree of correct. But as you understand the existing situation, uh, it ought to be, in your judgment, a transparently evil thing that we are engaged in, and you are derivatively concerned uh, because there isn't, a, uh, you, because there is not a shared sense of indignation. Yeah, like right. Your, like your own. Now, I don't say that I am right because I am indignant. Mm -hmm. Rather, I say that I, I think, in this case, I am right to be indignant, which is different. I have to prove that. You are right to be indignant if you are right. That's right, and that has to be demonstrated. That's that why that has I, to be which you know, dozens of pages of argument, about sure. it, which may or may not convince people. Can you sure. me? Yeah. Sure. But I, I agree. Well, I would, let, let me then, excuse me, did I interrupt you? I'm no, sorry. no, no. Uh, let, let me ask you this. Uh, uh, if, in fact, your concern is to communicate uh, your moral concern. To what extent have you spent um, a time uh, thinking about your techniques? Now, I, I say this seriously because uh, it is probably true that under uh, certain circumstances the communication of, of one's own indignation and fury and, and uh, restraint is, is best communicated emotionally, i.e. to one's own time talking about uh, screaming and yelling. Right. But if uh, it becomes observable that this doesn't bring people around, then you've got to uh, consider the problem of communication, which, which it becomes a moral problem, just as you would consent to argue Auschwitz or Buchenwald with somebody if there was a chance of, of, of dissipating something of the sort. Now, when, if you have given that problem any thought, do you, do you well, how come that you, you end up saying, as you do in your book, that uh, Senator Mike Mansfield is, quote, the kind of man who is the terror of our age? Well, let me put that in its context as well. Yeah. What I say is, I, I believe that, and what I say is that Senator Mansfield is an American intellectual in the best sense, a sane, reasonable, uh, scholarly man, the kind of man who is the terror of our age. And that's essentially what I was saying before. I think that the terror of our age is the, man. the sane, responsible, serious, quiet man who watches these things unfold and doesn't react to them. I include myself in in that, as I made, tried to make clear in the earlier statements. Well, if, um, uh, 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 put it this way, your counsel is surely a counsel of despair, uh, if on the one hand you are costus with your own uh, uh, relative moral superiority, and yet end up despising yourself, uh, appealing to scrupulosity for your own shortcoming. I mean, this makes, this makes well, things pretty... Not really. For one thing, I don't feel no. I don't feel any relative moral superiority, and I tried, maybe failed, but I tried very hard to express that in the book. That I said somewhere in the beginning that if there is any tone of self righteousness or anything like that, it's unintended and certainly undeserved, and I mean that very much. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, after all, given the feelings that I have, which I've just expressed, you know, and which you perceive, uh, I should be doing really strong things, which I don't think I am doing. So there's no there's no sense of moral superiority, and I'm not interested in simply, you know, throwing blame around or giving people marks. Mm -hmm. I think that the beginning of wisdom in this case is to recognize something about what we stand for in the world, what we're doing in the world. And I think when we do recognize that, we will feel an enormous sense of guilt. And I say somewhere in there that one should be very careful not to let confessions of guilt uh, overcome the possibility of action. I said that confessions of guilt can be very good therapy, as they can, as is well known. Uh, they, they're also very good preventative to action. And I think one should be very wary of that. In fact, I remember. Oh, well, I, think we, I think we should. I, I have some <coughs> remarks. I think that your uh, formulation of it is uh, uh, at least saintly, but um, uh, it still uh, is um, a, a, a dislocating, at least, <coughs> to people who fancy themselves as spending an equal amount of time uh, attempting to refine their whole apparatus of moral discrimination and who come up with conclusions directly at variance with your own. Now, 
the reason I haven't asked you at this moment to say, you know, why are we in Vietnam and such and such is because we've been all arguing about this for four, five, six years, yeah. and the chances of our coming up with anything, especially new or a small. Right. Yeah. That's one of the respects in which I think it is sort of an unarguable issue. Now, yeah. You know, the issues have just, one has been over them over and over. Yeah. But there, there, there are perhaps certain uh, aspects of the quarrel in Vietnam that uh, touch especially on your thesis and your concern and the whole nature of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, the suspicion that some people have of, uh, of the double standard of selective indignation. For instance, you refer to the heroic, heroic Vietnamese resistance, resistance to American power. I think it's absolutely heroic. Yeah, I'm sure. sure. Amazing. Now, uh, I, I, I understand if I understand enough about language to understand the use of heroism in that way. If you notice, there are a few lines uh, below I say, or above, I say something about quite apart from any question of politics. That's right, that's right, yeah. right. Now, suppose I were to write about uh, the heroic resistance of the Nazis to the Liberation Army, for instance, their use of torture, the use of mass reprisals. I don't consider that heroic. Well, why is that heroic? I mean, that means that they were doing everything they possibly could. No, I don't think that heroism well, doesn't... Well, then, I think we do disagree on the use of okay. language. But I don't think that reprisals we do, against... We do know that Viet Cong have used, uh, uh, have, have used uh, fire weapons to destroy whole villages, children, that they have disemboweled mayors and so on and so forth and hung them up and all that kind of well, stuff. Let's now, this is heroic. No, that is not. Oh. That's uh, depraved. That's like, depraved. In my opinion. Yeah. So but the, that's very, very marginal. The, it, well, well, why is it marginal? It, in fact, it's marginal. That's a question of fact. It's a question of fact, yeah. In fact, you know, this is quite, a, you know, uh, I think there's perfect unanimity about this in the people who've studied it. For example, if you look at someone like, say, Douglas Pike, you know, the American Foreign Service agent is the chief expert on the Vietnam, on, on the Viet Cong, and you read his book carefully, you discover that he points out that it was uh, in response to the American military effort that the Viet Cong turned from their attempt to build mass popular support by uh, through or through the organizational methods that involve giving people an actual role in uh, organizing and controlling their own uh, society and institutions. They turned from that to physical force in reaction to the American intervention. And if you read, if you, if I have many examples of this quote in the book from aid documents, let's say, or from pacification manuals where people yeah, point well, out... By the same token, you can say that the Nazis turned to torture in France uh, 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 in reaction to Eisenhower's landing in, in Normandy. The answer is that people so disposed to act are certain kinds of people, and I yearn for a recognition of this in your well, writings or in Douglas Pike's. As a matter of fact, Douglas Pike, uh, as you know, has certain difficulty with the fact that it is acknowledged that up to 25, 30,000 people uh, were individually killed by terrorists before when was that? America, uh, the, it was between 1950 and 1962. Mm -hmm. I think 9,000 is the figure that's given usually. Well, that, right, and, and, these are, and it's interesting to see what it was. I mean, if one really wants to talk about Viet Cong terror during the period prior to the American intervention, then uh, again, I think just about all commentators, uh, Dennis Warner, Bernard Fall, whoever you like, has agreed that uh, by and large, this was terror directed extremely selectively against oppressive and external village officials. The burning Sandy of Joan of Arc was selective. Pardon? The burning of Joan of Arc was selective too. Mm -hmm. well, but I think one is it was intended to establish a universal point. It was so intended to of Eichmann selective. Well, but you see, there's a very big difference. I think you see, if you want, to, um, personally, I'm against all kinds of terror. No mm -hmm. question. But if you want to understand the Viet Cong situation, then let's recognize a very great distinction, at least I recognize, let's see what the political point of the terror was. So after all, there were, during that period, there were about nine or 10,000, uh, according to American sources, there were maybe nine or 10,000 village officials of one sort or another uh, killed by the Viet Cong, largely with the support of the villages, that's what, but at the same time, recall that there were perhaps 160,000 Vietnamese, if we accept Bernard Falls figures again, killed by the Saigon government and the Americans. This is prior to 1965. That was a very different kind of terror, both in quantity and also in its political Yeah, content. I know, but if, if the, 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 it, it seems to me that you are attempting here to match uh, things which are not, uh, 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 which are not uh, equal. Mm. Uh, well, 9,000 and 160,000 are no, no means yeah, equal. I, I, I need to say that. Point. I need to say that. My point is that uh, one presumably distinguishes between an act of terror to terrorism, which you called depraved a moment ago, uh, and uh, uh, well, what you and describe, a like burning action, a village, is depraved. Yeah, a military action, which, which is equally depraved, depraved, military operation. Which is even more depraved. Oh, For example, you say, well, let, let, let me give you some examples of what I consider depraved. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm Brown, back in 1962 or three, I don't remember, uh, 
reported, it was a, I think AP or UP correspondent, reported that uh, Saigon officials were sending American Skyhawks, you know, airplanes over to, over Vietnamese, Vietnamese villages to wipe them out with napalm rays in order to cover instances of graft, for example. Well, that's, I think, depraved. And certainly, I don't condemn that, because, you see, uh, just to mention this matter of double standard, there are really three kinds of terror in Vietnam. There's Viet Cong terror, there's the Saigon government terror, and there's American terror. And if you read what I've written, I say practically nothing about either Viet Cong terror or terror carried out by the Saigon government. Uh, now, if one wanted to talk about that, one would have to point out that the terror carried out by the Saigon government is incredibly greater in extent and has a very different political purpose, which one could discuss. But I restrict yes, myself I, to I, discussing I American to terror. That's but, well, but, but, uh, but I, I, I gather yeah, we could, leave it. Go ahead. Yeah, I did. When we could, you know, that then sure. does become a matter of fact, which one could discuss. Sure. Yeah. But I, uh, as a matter of principle, almost uh, restrict myself to the discussion of American terror. Neither, not the terror carried out by the various sides in Vietnam, for many reasons. For one thing, because it's just qualitatively different in scale, and for another thing, because I, f I feel that we have some responsibility for it. See, I don't, uh, in the same sense, I don't talk about, you know, I've never written about the terror carried out by both sides in Nigeria, let's say. Uh, I don't like it, obviously, but I don't see any point in my giving them good or bad marks for it. On the other hand, if we were carrying out the terror, I would very definitely write about it. And I think, so there's no double standard as far as I can see. At least, let's say I have a standard in mind, one may or may not accept it. We will explore that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chomsky, we're talking there about uh, uh, American uh, terror, and I think you make a very accurate observation that we are responsible for what we do, but hardly responsible for what uh, other people do, except insofar as we are in a position to influence them. Sure. For instance, if there is a uh, mass starvation in uh, a Biafra, even though we did not cause it, there is a sense in which we are responsible if we don't do something to attempt to alleviate it. Yeah. Now, by the same token, uh, if we are prepared to agree uh, that uh, uh, it is not always easy to taxonomize military action into that which is terroristic and that which is purely a military operation, uh, we, we are left with, uh, with doubts, for instance, about uh, the bombing of Germany in 1942, 43, 44. Mm -hmm. You might contend that this was terroristic and unnecessary, and you might be right, although you're not a military expert, not, neither am I. But I do I think judge, there's a point to that. Uh, yeah, but I, I do judge that uh, uh, even if we all agree that what we did in Dresden was inexcusable, uh, uh, as a moral question, it's got to be understood in context of what was it that brought us to Dresden in the first instance. Absolutely. And yeah. what brought us to South Vietnam in the first instance, uh, in my judgment, was clearly uh, a, an uninterested, or I should say disinterested, uh, concern for the uh, uh, stability and possibilities of a region of the world. What, uh, to which what, we were period, about 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 what period do you feel that we had this disinterested relationship to Vietnam? Right now. No, at what period did we have it? Did it begin, let's say, 1951, for example? When, well, we, when the State Department bulletin points out that we must help the French uh, mm. reconquer their uh, former colony and we must eradicate all Vietnamese resistance down to its last roots in order well, to reestablish the French in power, wish, was that yeah, disinterested? To increase my vulnerability, I wish we had uh, helped the French. We did. We, we, we supported not them. But not sufficiently. Well, but, There's no uh, point in helping but, somebody but it's hardly, insufficiently. It was hardly disinterested when we attempted as, you know, with, with tremendous uh, uh, support, in fact, to reinstate French imperialism in South Vietnam. Now, it was disinterested in this sense, and, and I think this is an important distinction which you do touch on in your book. It's a disinterested act uh, if uh, my attempt to help or your attempt to help a particular nation is in order to spare you the possibility of a great ordeal in the future mm. uh, which will harm you, your family, your children, oh, yes, your republic. And in that now, sense, not, uh, Nazi now, Germany was also disinterested. Yeah, in, After agree, all, Nazi Germany was conquering Eastern yeah, Europe right. only in order to advance the so, uh, values of sure. the Christian spiritual civilization and to no, no, restore no, no, the no, Slavs no, no, to no, their no, rightful well, home that's, and that's so on and so forth. Totally right, disinterested. Look, I follow you. Yeah. I follow you. Yeah. But uh, if, if you want me to pursue that digression, I will. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but let's suspend it for a moment. Okay. I, I'm distinguishing that kind of disinterestedness between the kind of... With, but that's not a kind, kind of disinterestedness. That, you see, that's, that's something which includes as a special case every case of military aggression and colonialism in history. It's all disinterested in your sense. Well, all right, let, let me simply rest my case by saying that there is an observable distinction by intelligent men between a country... Uh, that reaches out and interferes with the affairs of another country, 
uh, because it has reason to believe that a failure to do so will result in universal misery, and that country which reaches out interferes with another country because it wants to establish Coca-Cola plants there and chase national banks and, and, and whatever and exploit it. Now, that is uh, an observable It's a conceptual distinction. Dis conceptual well, let's distinction. distinguish between a conceptual okay. distinction well, and a factual distinction. I'm prepared distinction. to do that. Right. It is a conceptual distinction, yeah. but in actual fact, the history of mm -hmm. colonialism shows that these two motivations can uh, coincide. That is practically every, I mean, there are exceptions, you know, the, probably the Belgians and, and the Congo are an exception. But by and large, the major imperialist ventures have been in the economic, uh, in the material interest or in the perceived material no, I'm interest. I'm not interested in the mathematics of the, but well, I'm, I'm interested. Let, let me finish. You have already conceded that it's not merely a conceptual difference. Yeah, I say it is a There are exceptions. There are a few exceptions. All right. Like, say, okay, okay. We're, we're, but, right, let's talk about the exceptions then. Well, well no, but the, the exceptions I, are at the difference. No, wait a minute. The exceptions, yeah. I, I mentioned, for example, the Belgians in the Congo. Mm -hmm. There they didn't have, they didn't even pretend to have a civilizing mission. Mm -hmm. There it was pure material self-interest. These are the exceptions. There are, as far as I know, no exceptions on the other side. There are, there are, I mean, maybe I've left out a case of history, but as I see the history of colonialism, the great mass of cases are cases where a powerful country was working in its perceived material self-interest and was covering what it was doing to itself and to the world with uh, very pleasant phrases about uh, preserving Christian values or helping the poor benighted natives or one thing or another. Now, there are a few exceptions where there was pure predatory imperialism. No, not even any pretense of doing anything, but these are quite rare. But not and we're in the mainstream not, not, not of imperialism. Not really. the, the, Pure uh, predatory imperialism? Uh, sure, rare, yeah. the, the history of the Roman Empire. Well, let's take more. Uh, I mean, the, since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, uh, since the Industrial Revolution. Well, you know, if, the if, if, if you say the people who refined the art of apologetics, I don't deny it. But uh, it, is, it is also true, and I think manifestly true, uh, that uh, uh, there have been interferences with the affairs of other nations whose purposes were, in my judgment, manifestly benign. For example? Well, for, for instance, the Truman Doctrine. Oh, I don't think that was manifestly benign at all. That was an attempt to well, the Greeks develop an order. I think the, the Greek situation the, 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 was benign, not at all. We were I say to the Greeks' testimony is more interesting to me than yours. Which Greek testimony? <laughs> the, the testimony, testimony of the, the te thousands of people who were thrown into jail and... Uh, well, know, not, not, no, not, I, I grant not the testimony of the Greek communists who were beaten. Or the Greek peasants yeah. who were... Well, you know, I, I, there again, is it a conceptual difference that uh, between the person who desires a life under some kind of freedom and one who desires life under some kind of... Kind of, who, who, was uh, it under the, communism? Uh, well, um, no, for, because there's no there's no such opposition in Greek there in Greece. There was a distinction between a very repressive regime which we instituted in 1946 and another regime. I don't know what it would have been that would have grown out of the victory of the so-called communists. Now, if uh, you see what we did was had nothing to do with freedom. What we this instituted is, was this a is absolute historical romancing. I don't because because the, 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 the number of people who were slaughtered in Greece first by the communist insurgency, then by the Nazis, then again by the communists. But, uh, add up Nazi to an communist enormous insurgency percent. before the Nazis? Uh, Which uh, one not is insurgency, there? conquest. C communist conquest before the Nazis uh, Communist in insurgency. Prior to the Nazis the, the in civil, the, Yes, the civil war of the uh, early 40s. My point, the early, my, my point the is that the, the Greeks... No, your history is quite no, confused there. Around, no. No, it isn't there, was no, there was no communist insurgency prior to the Nazis. There were communist resistance bands well, that fought against the Nazis. This is not of nomenclature. The point is that the the 40 year old or the the 45 year old greek has fought three times mm -hmm. uh, in a certain ventures they in one of which uh, they acknowledge that we bail who, them who is they out uh, who is they the rulers well, of greece yeah. acknowledge that no no also the people oh of, I'm, not, of I'm quite unaware of that i'm quite unaware that the people of greece have well, spoken even, on this even, issue even papandreou you like him i assume because he hates us <laughs> no but not pa at all. Pa papandreou not at all. george papandreou Pap was one of the people who I'm was talking who about we and yeah and i'm talking about andrea which makes it even is andreas they both <laughs> very both on record as being grateful to president truman for his intervention in that part of the world in 1947. Well, in that case, I disagree with him on that issue I mean, I really yeah, do. I think we had yeah. no right to intervene in Greece in 1947. Now we're talking about rights, and which, I, I gets don't away from the any... which gets us away from the discussion. All right, let's talk about, right, let's talk about whether, 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 or not, whether or not there is, there is such a thing as relatively disinterested international interference. And it seems to me well, that our that America's record is rather good. We went through an imperialist phase. But we, we pulled out of it faster than any country in the history of civilization. Oh, I, I think we're very deep. Why did we right pull out of the Philippines, for instance? We pulled out of the Philippines because it became a bad investment. We, Why? Because American, uh, Ameri if you look, American agricultural interests were very much opposed to the, uh, back in the, in the mid-30s, they were very strongly opposed to the uh, free trade relationships which allowed 
Philippine crops to compete with them. That's why we pulled out of the Philippines. Why do, they, why do these agricultural interests authorize us to intervene in South Vietnam? Well, they did. If you consider this, this is because a, we didn't intervene this on is the basis critical of, dimension. No, I say that in the Philippines it was the critical dimension. Look, the world is a complex place. I'm aware there of are it. certain <laughs> interests that were involved. MIT in our, is a complex place. Well, there were certain <laughs> interests that were involved in our Philippine venture. There are different <clears throat> interests that are involved in our Vietnam venture. You mm -hmm. see, our Vietnam. Don't forget that with the Second World War, America's imperial interests expanded enormously. I mean, prior to the Second World War, we were sort of a marginal imperialist power, except for the Monroe Doctrine. But since the Second World War, we became the world's major imperialist power. And Vietnam is simply one piece of an attempt to construct a very large integrated world system, yeah. of which Greece was another piece. Yeah, we became an imperial power, Mr. Chomsky, in this sense, in the sense that we inherited primary responsibility for our, a, any chain of action that might involve us in a third world war. No, I don't believe And, and something that might involve the entire world in Holocaust. And no, under I don't circumstances, uh, well, I know you don't believe it, but but uh, in fact, I think that our, it might our, be refreshing our, to listen to this point of view, yeah. which is that uh, there are people who do believe oh, sure. that that America, unhappily and certainly not desiring it, inherited the responsibility for trying to abort international Holocaust, uh, and has from time to time done so by such ventures as the Truman Doctrine, Marshall Aid, and things like that. Yeah, I don't agree. With Marshall with Aid, not just no. Marshall Aid is quite different. First of all, Marshall. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. I interrupted you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, th you've now mentioned Marshall Aid for the first time, and Marshall, Aid ha Marshall Plan Aid has to be distinguished quite sharply from the Truman Doctrine. Why? But why? Because the Truman Doctrine was a doctrine of military intervention, and the Marshall Plan was our first attempt at a major but aid But you, you do understand just, that sometimes a, a soldier can be as useful as a bushel of wheat, don't you? No, look, nevertheless, if we're going to be at all clear about the American role, we're certainly going to distinguish between military intervention and economic intervention. They're mm -hmm. very different in the way they function. Now, the fact of the matter is that neither was disinterested in your sense, I don't think. But they're very different in the impact that they had. Uh, the Truman Doctrine, I think, was a disastrous venture. I think the Marshall Plan uh, was our first attempt at a major but aid But you, you do understand just, that sometimes no, a, a soldier can be as useful as a bushel of wheat, don't you? No, look. Nevertheless, if we're going to be at all clear about the American role, we're certainly going to distinguish between military intervention and economic intervention. They're mm -hmm. very different in the way they function. Now, the fact of the matter is that neither was disinterested in your sense, I don't think, but they're very different in the impact that they had. Uh, the Truman Doctrine, I think, was a disastrous venture. I think the Marshall Plan uh, was arguable. I mean, one understood well, what how it was do you for, you know? explain the schizophrenia? I don't agree with it. How, how do you explain the schizophrenia of a public which willed both more or less simultaneously. The public On the one hand, you say either. the no. public is in public didn't will either. Disinterested. The public oh. didn't will either. Well, the government, the government, all right, the government. Oh, the government well, the, oh, yeah. because, because both were... But the government backed by the public. How's that? How, how do you explain that the same government on, on Monday uh, did the Truman Doctrine, which you consider simply sort of being a projection of the evil impulse of the government, and on Tuesday did something which you consider to be very good? I didn't what say happened I to the government between Monday and Tuesday? Uh, first of all, I didn't say I considered it to be very good. I said it's, very, it's rather different, and, and one has to bring different standards to bear in evaluating it. But why, why is it different? Let me give you an example. Suppose you're a farmer, because uh, and, and, temper, and, and, and you need agriculture, uh, you need fertilizer, yep. so you apply to me for fertilizer, but just before I get it to you, somebody comes up with a bayonet, and is about to uh, uh, is, is is about to make it impossible for you to continue you, farming. Now, you see, you're begging in that particular instance, is there a strategic difference between my giving you the fertilizer and my giving the the soldier who routes? That's not. So you're you're talking the about the dream world. The real world uh -huh. is one because the real world is one in which the alternatives were bringing uh, coming with a bayonet, which is on an American rifle held by an American-backed uh, Greek soldier, and the alternative to that was giving the kind of aid which was used, in fact, to construct the kind of society in Western Europe that we wanted to see developed there. Now, these are two very different things. It's a very different thing to introduce, uh, uh, to run for the Greek army uh, a counterinsurgency program with uh, military support and many military men involved. That's one kind of thing, one sort of repression imposed on the Greek population through American intervention. One might argue whether it's right or wrong, but mm -hmm. that's, that's well, to be very sharply why do you distinguished. Why imposed? Why do you say it imposed? Is it because your presumption here, my, my presumption uh, is, is your presumption here is, is that the Greeks well, let me tell you, would so like the yes. kind of regime no, which look, my, resulted my, my, my assumption in is that all intervention is imposed by any country. That is, any, you see, I, well, I believe that quite generally... Did we impose on the French when we liberated the Na them from the Nazis? Was that an imposition? We didn't conquer France. We moved the, the, the Germans out we of... Didn't. Just from, from an outside we, invading yeah, force. We invaded But France. we didn't conquer it from its own people. 
See, in Greece, we were trying to conquer it from its own people. But there you're willing to credit the anti-Nazis as their own people, but you're not in Greece willing to credit the anti-Germans the as their army, own people. The German army was there. But, but, there was no outside army in Greece other than ours. Look, there are modalities of outside intervention. Oh, but look, no. there's a very sharp difference yeah. between... Uh, there were, it, just a minute, there's a very sharp difference Laval between... Laval was not a, a Nazi. Mm -hmm. But, but Laval, Laval wouldn't have lasted for five minutes without the German army. And no, no would, no would Makarios have lasted for five minutes without the help of Russian aid. Uh, but wait a minute. In fact, big, as you know, no when Russian Stalin troops, got tired no of Makarios, troops, he pulled out. Uh, but look, now let's, let's be careful again. I mean, there's a difference between... First of all, I'm opposed to military aid to other countries, whether by us or by the Soviet Why? Union. Well, let's come back to that because it's a more important thing. And that is that I'm even far more opposed to the uh, imposition of regimes by foreign troops. Now, in the case of Germany, let's say, in the case of France, the, uh, the uh, Pétain government, the Pétain Laval government, the Vichy government, was supported by German troops. Mm -hmm. Had the German, mil they weren't throughout the country necessarily because there was certainly indigenous support. But there's no question that if German military force had been withdrawn to the other side of the Rhine, uh, then there would have been a, an overthrow of the Vichy government and France would have had some different form of government. Now, in that case, our invasion of France was, uh, whether one likes it or not, was, is, it was in reaction to an occupying external force. It's just pure confusion to identify that with the case of Greece when we were trying to liberate, uh, we were trying to select the kind of society that Greek, Greece would have and we were trying to save the rulers that we had designated as appropriate from their own population. There were no outside forces. But don't you realize that in your book, uh, and that's why you're not willing to, to be consistent in carrying out this argument, you, you're constantly talking about our satellizing of places like uh, uh, Cuba and the Dominican Republic and so on and so forth, mm. uh, and yet we never occupied them in oh, the sense sent, in which you're oh, talking about. Well, well, we never occupied the Dominican Republic. We sent 25,000 troops there in 1965 no, in no, an occupation. I, I, no, I'm talking about Pre, I'm, I'm talking well, about the American Marines were in there dozens well, of times. Oh, since let, let, I think I mean, you're being evasive, and I don't think evasive, you want to be. No, let no, me no, ask no. you I mean, this: I, Is it possible? It is not evasive at all. Is it I mean, possible? You know, we just simply repeatedly no. sent troops to is it possible, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is it possible to satellize a nation without having an occupying army there? Yes, it is. All right, then there goes your French, your tedious French explanation. Oh, no, not at say. all, because that <laughs> doesn't happen to be. The, you see, we're talking about a real situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could talk about some ideal situation and. You know, have an academic and discussion I'm about saying, it. I'm therefore, it is possible for real Vietnam to satellize South Vietnam, presumably, without even it's, it's uh, logically uh, occupying possible, it, it militarily in, in a formal sense. Yeah, it, but it didn't happen, though. So there's well, no point the, this is an it. argument considering which there's, there are two points of view. Well, uh, let's discuss uh, it then. Historically. Yeah, in fact, you see, there's, there's much point, more, yeah. if, you, if you want to be serious about it, there's more evidence that South Vietnam tried to colonize North Vietnam than conversely. In fact, South Viet well, look, South Vietnamese commandos were going... Uh, military forces, regular military forces, were going north uh, considerably earlier than, than the time when we even proclaimed that the infiltration began from north to south. Did they bump into the refugees coming south? The refugees were coming south and uh, were going in both directions, in yeah. fact, in 1954-55, and according, at least according to Bernard Fall, the uh, uh, commandos began going north in 56 or 57. The first claimed yeah. infiltration from the north was in 59, and that was South Vietnamese coming south. So, if we, you know, if one wants to talk about, again, the real world, the first motion yeah, the, the of... Trouble first is motion you, of you, you know, your difficulty, Mr. Chomsky, is, you, in my judgment, you never know when neatly to begin mm -hmm. your well, historical sequence. Well, you, you uh, choose sequence. the point of beginning. Well, then. well the, po the point really is that uh, if you... If you're starting to say that 1959 was a provocation because it was... No, it wasn't a provocation. Southern I, say going claim that the I say, well, began. but how about the people who were going from north to south who were talking about the misery that had when? been going about Ho Chi Minh and so forth? When was it's that? Like, I mean, well, which people are you talking about? I don't know. Well, well I'm talking about Vietnamese north and, and south. Uh, your your, 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 your trouble, I think, is, is neatly captured in, 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 in the remark made recently by Czechoslovakia that uh, Czechoslovakia is, after all, the most neutralist country in the world since it declines to interfere even with its own internal affairs. Uh, I'm and, afraid and, uh, I don't see the relevance. Uh, well, 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 the, the relevance is very simply that uh, uh, you, you, you start your line of discussion at a moment that is historically useful for you. you that's the I grand say, you the, you fact the beginning. of you the post-war world right. is that the communist, communist imperialists, by the use of terrorism, by the use of by deprivation of freedom, uh, have contributed to the continuing bloodshed, and the sad thing about it is not only the bloodshed, but the fact that they seem to dispossess you of the power of rational. May I, may I say something? Sure. Yeah. I think that's about five percent true, mm -hmm. and about, or maybe ten percent true. It certainly well, is. Tr why it, do you give that? Uh, may I complete a sentence? Sure. I mean, it's it's perfectly true that there were areas of the world, in particular Eastern Europe, where uh, where Stalinist imperialism 
uh, uh, very brutally uh, took control and still maintains control. But there are also very vast areas of the world where we were doing the same thing. And uh, there's quite an interplay in the Cold War. You see, the, what you just described is a, I believe, a mythology about the Cold War, which might have been tenable ten years ago, but which is quite inconsistent with contemporary scholarship. Ask a Czech. Ask, ask a Guatemalan, ask a Dominican, uh, ask President of the Dominican Republic, ask, you know, ask a, you uh, ask you, a person from well, South Vietnam, you know, ask a yeah, Thai. Well, obviously, we can't get away. if you can't distinguish between the nature of our uh, venture in Guatemala and the nature of the Soviet unions in Prague, What's then the, we have real well, difficulty. Explain, explain the difference. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Greenfield. Mr. Chomsky, you, you state in one of the essays in your book, the unpleasant fact is that if one wishes to pursue the Munich analogy, there is only one plausible candidate for the role of Hitler, and by that you mean the United States. There are other references to Nazi Germany's conduct of foreign policy in our own. And you also less emphatically suggest that a lot of the internal policies of the United States government have left millions of its own citizens hungry or exploited. If this is the fact, that is to say, if the nature of our society is functionally indistinguishable in this respect from, from Nazi Germany, then doesn't that legitimate any tactic that one wishes to use in opposition? Well, I certainly don't believe that your assumption, that is, I don't believe and I don't think I ever say that our society is functionally indistinguishable no. from Nazi Germany. No, that's what, what I say is that I want if zero one in. wants to pursue... I want to zero in. Yeah. So, if so I, by I would blowing up the troop something. train, we prevent 5,000 American soldiers from going to Vietnam to participate in what you do explicitly yes. call a criminal war. Right. Isn't that a moral act? Oh, I think that, yes, it would be. If sabotage would, in fact, contribute to ending the war, I would be in favor of sabotage. So and let me give you some concrete So that's examples. a tactical decision, not a, tactical a moral decision. In fact, I'll give you some examples. What the Berrigans have done, for example, at Catonsville and Milwaukee, I think is very heroic and, in fact, saintly. But that is not killing American soldiers. Oh, no, no. Well, you were talking about sabotage. You're talking about blowing up a troop train. train. I oh, would no, assume there'll be I'm loss sorry, of I, life. I'm sorry. I thought you meant, let's say, you know, stop preventing a train from going. No, uh, I mean, I, I blowing up, I mean, sabotage, assassination, you know, what, what all right, the heroes see, in America... I, I would, first of all, make a sharp distinction, as, for example, the Americans did, between attacks on property and attacks on people. That's what I want to know. Fundamental distinction. But then, you see, if one raises the question about uh, attacks on people, then I think there are very tricky issues. See, one would, I can concede, I'm, you know, I would have been against assassinating Hitler, for example, because I'm against murder. But if I believe that assassination of Hitler would have really contributed to the end of the, to ending right. the war, I think one could have given argument, given an argument. Now, if, if it was true, pretend it's Lyndon Johnson, part, and that would pertain to Lyndon Johnson. But uh, in neither case, incidentally, do I think that yeah, it practically would have. And yeah. uh, Miss Hockman. I would like to ask Mr. Buckley what he thinks the motives of the people who are in favor of the war in Vietnam are. Uh, putting it very simply, um, how can we possibly hope to help universal misery when we are so miserable here? Well, I think we're less miserable here. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, you may not be a, a, a happy young lady, but I'm sure you're not as miserable as you would be if, for instance, uh, you didn't have a free press, if you weren't able to write such poetry as you wanted to write, you couldn't join a labor union, if you couldn't express yourself as you liked, uh, uh, if uh, uh, your, uh, the mayor of your town uh, might be uh, uh, disemboweled uh, tomorrow. I think that there are, there are observable differences Aren't you in favor of between the nature, between what freedom you have here, or, or put it this way, between your misery and theirs. If you, wouldn't be, uh, if you wouldn't have saturation bombing take well, place I, in your I, just, I want to disagree with you for the moment, because I, I think that um, there is a certain condition, a human condition, the condition of guilt, which Mr. Chomsky speaks about, and which for me is the most interesting point of his argument. The guilt that we feel here, which in a way may keep people from writing poetry or from writing anything that they think, because they're absolutely um, stifled they by the climate the of guilt. Get on the best out of this. Excuse me? They managed to write their complaints. <coughs> but I know of many people who are, not, who are not writing now because of the war in Vietnam. who are not functioning because of their guilt. Well, it's not, it's, not an, it's not an aspect of my responsibility for foreign policy to encourage you to externalize your complaints. But uh, if, if you want to, there, there are any number of book publishers, magazine publishers, radio stations, television stations who are glad to hear them out, which I think is qualitatively different from what exists, for instance, in uh, North Vietnam. Or South. 
or Greece, well, or Greece, not quite so much. Or Brazil, a or a dozen yeah. other countries. A little bit less so. Mm -hmm. Sure, less so. It, I think it's true. No, mm -hmm. it's not true. And right. publishing is the only what's true. What's true is that a nation at war does not have the same amount of liberties as a nation at peace. Uh, Abraham Lincoln suspended the right to habeas corpus, yeah. uh, and the oldest parliament in the history of the world didn't have an election for 11 years during yes, the day. You know, war. if you compare the state of freedom in North and South Vietnam prior to the war, as some people have done, like Joseph Buttinger, I'm afraid it doesn't come out the way you like. Well, I think it does come out the way. Not by the evidence that's been as presented. As the refugees who, or number of the refugees who left North Vietnam, compare them with those who left South Vietnam. Uh, that's, that's a very different issue. I, what, I said, if you, what I was talking about is the right of free expression in North and South Vietnam. I mean, take a look, for example, at Buttinger's analysis, you know, where he runs through cases. Uh, quite apart from that, uh, take a look at, for example, again, you know, pick your authority. I mean, let it be Bernard Fall, let it be almost anyone you like. See, there's a great amount of village democracy which was instituted in North Vietnam, and in fact has also been instituted in the Allied-dominated areas of South Vietnam, which is something qualitatively different than anything that has existed in Asian societies before. And this exists simultaneously with, let me be quite clear, this exists simultaneously with a good deal of repression and certainly <coughs> civil liberties of the sort that we're used to. Tosky, the most, the, well, one of the most libertarian constitutions in the history of the world was written by the Soviet Union. I'm not talking about constitutions, I'm talking about that. What kind of freedom is experienced by somebody in North Vietnam? The answer is that the freedom is perpetually insecure. Oh, well, you don't for, know for that. reasons. Uh, you, you see, I know you that Ho Chi Minh himself has wept uh, over, just, over the occasional just, necessity to kill 40, 50,000 of his own. Not the necessity, the occasional fact. Uh, uh, but just, but just, uh, just one moment, sorry, though, what I was talking, yeah. Uh, very, uh, not only sarcastic, but also wrong. And you see, it's very important to recognize, if you want to understand what communism means in Southeast Asia, to realize that along with many authoritarian and repressive practices, which I certainly don't condone, there is on the side a great deal of democratization. There's been a liberation of I energies and involvement. Oh, in nonsense about this, I don't think you're right. Uh, I the, great, the, great, the great paradigm of Red China, in which the AFL-CIO itself concedes to uh, uh, to tw something in the neighborhood of 20 million victims on that particular group. I'm talking, that's I'm quoting them. Uh, well, perhaps, the AFL perhaps I didn't ask you whether that was the correct. The didn't have a commission. Uh, there. No one has claimed the million people killed through through Chinese communist purges. Oh. Absolutely no one. Well, no one serious at least. Quite but a, it was published in the New Leader. Fine. Which well, the New Leader, yes, of course, the New Leader might. I mean, but, but I'm talking about no CIA plant. Uh, well, I said no one serious has. Take a look at the China <coughs> Journal. Well, I, take a look at China. I, I consider this. But you, see, piece, uh, you see, I think you're missing the point, really, and I think it's an important point. See, I think in looking at China, one has to recognize a great deal of repressive practice, a great deal of authoritarianism, and one also has to recognize a great deal of, dem of spontaneous uh, democratic structure of a sort which never existed in Asia before, and if you want to know the truth, to some extent doesn't even exist in our society. Now, these things exist side if, by if side. If you read uh, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, you find out that there's an extraordinary democratic structure even inside concentration camps. But uh, no, it seems to me that, that it's, it's no, almost look, profane no, look, to make this observation. I think it's profane to make that analogy, because I'm talking about true democracy in I which... I so. uh, Look, in which people... Yeah. In which the, the people who... The peasants who live in a village but, control the institutions of their lives. They control the... Like, the yeah, you want to get out, you bump into the Berlin Wall on either side of the island. There's think. no Berlin Wall in China. There's the equivalent of the Berlin Wall. There's the sea and there's starvation. There's no, there's no, yeah. that's just the point. You see, starvation has been very largely overcome in China. Yeah, because, they have, because they have something like 94% of people working on agriculture. But I think Mr. Doxey has a question for you. They also have two bumper crops in the last year. Uh, Professor Chomsky, when you say, as you said about 30 minutes ago, that there was a relativity of truth between nations, would you classify... Relativity of truth? I don't know. Relativity of truth, you said, in the international scene. I don't understand the comment. If I said it, I don't know what it means. Well, would you call yourself a political... Uh -huh. Would you call yourself a political rel rel relativist? I, I don't understand the concept. Well, put it this way. Do you believe in the natural law and uh, transcendental truth, let's say, a fixing social unit? I think that there's some there's something to the <coughs> doctrine of natural law, but I, I think that that's much more abstract than anything we've been discussing here. Well, but uh, wouldn't that then justify the use of terror in, uh, let's say, stopping a, a tenet of the natural law from being broken, yeah. or stopping, let's say, the ends from... Uh, let's bring it down to earth. I see, uh, I'm, of course, opposed to terror, any rational person is. But I think that if we're serious about the question of terror, if we're serious about the question of violence, we have to recognize that uh, that it is a tactical and hence moral matter. Incidentally, tactical issues are basically moral issues. They have to do with human consequences. And if we're interested in, let's say, diminishing the amount of violence in the world, 
it's at least arguable and perhaps even sometimes true that a terroristic act does diminish the amount of violence in the world. Hence, a person who is opposed to violence will not be opposed to that terroristic act. Well, exactly the same thing. That's right. Yeah. Now, and he happens to be wrong in the case in which he applies it. No, you see, these principles tell you very little about real cases. No, but that's what's, that's, I must say, that's the one thing that bothers me more about what you've been saying and the way you write, mm -hmm. that, that that kind of language, that is the notion of a terroristic act which restricts consequent violence, mm -hmm. is precisely what Rothstein says in the view from the seventh floor when after this whole analysis about yeah. the moral world, he says yeah, there's I not think. a single place where we don't have major military might be well, I think that the, the real point here is that when you try to formulate general principles that will apply to arbitrary political uh, affairs, you find very, that you can only make very vacuous and empty statements. See, if one wants to talk in perfect abstraction from any real situation about the justification for violence and terror, then you come up with platitudes and empty remarks and so on. The point is that, you know, there are no very general principles that apply to such circumstances, <coughs> if, or if there are, no one has enunciated and formulated them. So what one really has to do is look at the concrete historical situation. Now, where I would disagree, maybe Rostow and I would agree at this level of abstraction on, on uh, the use of violence to prevent less violence, more, uh, greater violence. Where we would disagree is in our evaluation of what is happening in this concrete historical situation. So therefore, and that's no, where one's attention ought to be. So, so, so therefore, you have no philosophical objection to the way in which Mr. Rostow states his case, merely to its applicability well, in great, existing circumstances. No, I, I say uh, at this level, I, would, I might not. I don't know what he says. But he would in other things. But in other things, I have a very great dif uh, difference. For example, Walt Rostow says that we should uh, try to strengthen, that the great threat of China to us is that it will succeed and provide a model to other countries. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. Is no, that why you kept him out of MIT? Uh, I, uh, I assure you that I had nothing to do with keeping him out of MIT. I'd be delighted to have him back. He's a great help to us when he's around. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you all.